Good morning, everyone. It is my real pleasure to welcome you all to the COP26 Water Action event on behalf of the Marques Partnership Global Climate Action Focal Point, CWE, and the U U uh, IUCN, uh, along with their supporting partners, AGWA and CDP, and all the other supporting water organizations involved in, that, in today's event. Uh, I would like to refer especially to the work that Jennifer and Kate and James and Ingrid have done, and through you, an amazing team has allowed us not only to put together this event, it's about the amazing work that you've been doing for so long. Thanks so much. It's not easy at all, but I think that these people, re re I mean, they, they require a, a round of applause because you're doing the amazing work. I know we have a very full agenda, so let's uh, dive right in. Uh, climate resilient management of water and freshwater ecosystem can offer a range of impactful, largely untapped solutions for mitigating, m mitigating carbon emissions. For example, the use, storage, distribution, and treatment of water and wastewater together contribute to about 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. To keep global warming below 1.5 degrees, a significant contribution from nature-based solutions is not necessary, it's urgent, it's critical. For example, wetlands provide the largest carbon stock among terrestrial ecosystems, and yet their loss rate is three times higher than, uh, than that other uh, forests, rendering water management and the protection of freshwater ecosystem vital elements of global climate mitigation activities and strategies. Similarly, there is no adaptation without water. So by investing in the resilience of our water resources, services and systems, we can reduce climate risk to people, ecosystem and economies. Accelerating and scaling action on water-related solutions for climate change mitigation and resilience, therefore, are definitely a win-win proposition. Ladies and gentlemen, it is, tap, is it time to tap the potential? We know, probably many of you, if not all of you, that when it comes to the 2030 breakthroughs ambition, Water UK has led us to ha having achieved the, the breakthrough ambition. So we have the capacity in this room. That wasn't necessarily what we were envisioning not too long ago. So this sector is providing the concrete solutions and is now underway, the scale and, and, and the speed that, that the whole nature-based solution system requires. So thanks for that, and I would now like to introduce SOS from the kids, a youth corps from London and West Papua, who are joining us this morning to share a message that we hope will inspire and touch your hearts. Thanks so much. Uh, hi everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Um, it's really great. Uh, today we're going to be singing to you. Uh, we, uh, us three, we don't have our full choir here, which is quite unfortunate, but I hope you enjoy it. Uh, today we're going to be singing a song called It's Time to Heal. We made this in collaboration with Fuchla Voices from West Papua, who right now are feeling terrible effects of climate change. This community was devastated by floods in 2019, which swept away houses, damaged schools, roads, and bridges around where they lived. These floods are becoming more frequent and severe due to climate change. On the screens behind us, you will be able to see Fuchla voices recording their song in Sentani, which is their endangered local language. We hope you enjoy it.
and their future is on your hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, SOS from the kids. We've received the message, time to heal and time to act now. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jennifer John. I'm a senior policy manager at the Stockholm International Water Institute, CV in Stockholm. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, to open this event. First and foremost, I'd like to say some very important housekeeping remarks before I introduce our guest of honor. Um, and potentially life-saving. We do have to vacate this room exactly at 2.15. We've got a full program, so I'll try to speed us through. Um, please make sure that you clear the area around you, you take your belongings, so that we can properly sanitize for the next event. So we, we do ask that you pick up your trash. Let's try to leave this place even cleaner than we left it. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd love to introduce Professor Hubbard, who's here on a mission to educate us about uh, the impacts of climate change, principally on global uh, changes in the global water cycle. And Professor Hubbard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I definitely drew this short straw there. Um, how to have a boring, middle-aged geography professor follow up on that act just before. It's very lovely, thank you. So um, I'm going to briefly talk about Asia's or the Earth's freshwater towers today. Um, high stakes at high altitudes. Um, I love this image. It's a satellite image, ESA, uh, European Space Agen Agency, Sentinel satellite image of the western Kunlun Mountains um, of Tibet. Um, and what I love about it is the stark contrast there between the glaciers, um, these sort of worm-like things in the, at the bottom of the image, on the southern end, um, going from snow, the light blue, blue cayenne, um, cyan, and then uh, into dark blue. There's a few lakes there on the eastern side, dark blue, 
and then the stark contrast with the arid, dry Tibetan plateau. And that's really what this is about. This is what's going on. And we'll see this region come up in a, in a couple of minutes' time. So a bit of a geography lesson, I'm afraid. I'm sorry about this, but I can't get away from my roots. Um, but this is one of the most sort of fantastic areas of the globe. Um, it supports a huge population. But what we mean by the water towers of Europe is, is the snow and ice, the water, H2O, fresh water that's locked up in frozen form in the high elevation mountains, Asia's high mountains, the Himalaya, the Hindu Kush, the Karakoram, uh, the Kunlun Mountains in the north, and Tian Shan. And it's this waters, the, the, the water that comes off this melt uh, of ice and snow that feeds some of the major Asian, Central Asian, and Eastern Asian rivers. Um, in China, we have the Yellow and Yangtze River, then the Mekong, and then the great rivers of, of, of Central Asia, the uh, Indus, the Ganges, and the, the Brahmaputra. Um, and all of these are fed by glacial melt to some extent, and it's a region that is undergoing severe climate warming. Um, the central mountains of Asia, this massive uh, mountain belt, is warming at, at a rate that is almost double the regional average, and over the next 50 years is, is predicted to, to rise by one to two degrees, uh, up to four degrees in places. And what I'm here to tell you about is, is, is the impact of that change, both in temperature and precipitation patterns. This is a monsoonal area, highly seasonal uh, precipitation that feeds these massive rivers. There's over a, a billion people that are fed, um, or, 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 or um, uh, that are fed by these rivers um, and the fresh water that comes out of them, and, and the resource base of it. So, what's going on? What's the point? Uh, a, a little glaciology lesson to shift on here. Um, but effectively, these are literally frozen reservoirs of water going on there. And, and the key with any reservoir is that it buffers the seasonal impacts of big snowfall, big rainfall, big snowfall that occurs during the wet and winter seasons. And then that, when it warms up, it melts and therefore moderates the amount of discharge and runoff that feeds these great big river systems. So the glaciers are effectively a bank account, a bank balance, which with inputs and credits going in in the form of snowfall, and then later on in the season, they, they release that water as melt, and that allows a much more constant discharge throughout the season. And that's crucial to everything that goes on downstream. So if we look at the, the primary sources of water for these big rivers, I won't go through all of them. I'll, I'll, I'll really concentrate on the Indus here. Um, it's fed, uh, it's a transboundary river. It starts off in Tibet, China, flows to some extent through Afghanistan, into India, and then is responsible for irrigation of over 90% of Pakistan's agriculture. It's a huge river basin that it feeds getting on for a quarter of a billion people. It's massive and it's undergoing huge change. But what's changing here with the increased temperature is that what we're having is that the glaciers are retreating. And glaciers, for example, of, of the Indus supply up to 40% of that fresh water that is supplied downstream. So this is a dwindling resource which is unsustainable. What kind of time scales have we got? Well, this is some of my own work and some modeling from the Tibetan plateau here. And what we're looking at is projected changes, re recent changes in temperature, projecting them over the next 100, 200 years. And what we effectively see here on the right-hand corner, the top right-hand corner, effectively, these glaciers are disappearing into nothing over the next 100, 200 years. And even though the peak runoff is actually increasing over the next 50 years, it's pretty dire news thereafter as this resource, as this battery, as this bank account runs out, goes into deficit. 
So if we look at the Indus River Basin, as I said, it feeds a quarter of a billion people, just under, and that population is set to increase by 50% uh, by over the next 30 years. It's, uh, to call it a, a, a conflict-free zone would be a terrible thing. What's going on in Afghanistan, the tensions between India, Pakistan, and, 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 and China are, are hard to fathom at the moment, and this is a total political nightmare if you consider future resource and provision of this river. Um, as I said, the Indus River provides 50% of Pakistan's hydroelectricity, about 50% of its total energy, and 90% of its agricultural output. Pakistan is the most irrigated country on planet Earth. This is a big deal. <coughs> Don't have time, I've got 40 seconds to wrap this up, so I'm not going to go into this bank balance, but all I'm saying is that already, right now, uh, the Indus River Basin is highly stressed. It's a political hotbed, and it's highly stressed in terms of what's being taken out for irrigation, agriculture, and the like. Finally, I'll finish off with this slide, and it's to say this issue of water towers is not just confined to Asia. We have very many dry, glacier-fed regions of the world um, I worked for my PhD in Patagonia and the European Alps, the Maipu Valley, very fertile region of Chile, also massively fed by glaciers that are dwindling from a very dry part of the Andes. Likewise, the Rhone and the Po. I did my PhD on glaciers in the Al Valle Alps in Switzerland, um, and they are now gone. I will leave you with that dire message and hope that we can come up with some solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard. I'll invite Mark and Dolph to the stage, and I'll also introduce you while you're walking up. Um, so we're going to be joined by three business leaders who are thirsty for change and calling on their peers and non-state actors in general to tap the potential of water for climate action. Mark Engel is the Chief Supp uh, Supply Chain Officer for Unilever. We have John Foley online with us, who is the CEO of MNG, and Dolph van der Brink, CEO of Heineken. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, delighted to be here and to see the emphasis in this COP on water, because very simply put, water is life. And this week we've seen an unprecedented focus on nature in COP. And when we think about nature, we think about trees and we think about forests. But we should equally be thinking about water as our most precious resource. For, for if climate change is the shark, then water scarcity is the teeth, because it's where climate change is going to bite us for most. And the longer we leave the problem, the more expensive and difficult becomes the solution for everyone. And you all know that the world's poorest people are already suffering. Natural water resources, which has been free for centuries, are suddenly beginning to fail. <laughs> Yesterday, we met with Pushnapath Krishnamurti, who is a climate and peace activist, originally from India and now here in the UK. And he actually walked from London to Glasgow. And Push said to us that he had personally witnessed people being killed in a fight over a bucket of water. Agriculture uses 70% of the world's fresh water supply, and industry takes another 20%, which just leaves 10% for human consumption. And it's estimated that 4.3 billion people are now struggling with water scarcity for at least one month in a year. And this number will only rise, which means that we do need a radical change in approach. Now at Unilever, we have set bold and science-based targets to reduce our own emissions. But reductions alone will not protect us from impacts of climate change. Whether it's farmers growing crops or colleagues operating factories or in fact the two and a half billion citizens in the world that use our products daily, climate change will most likely be experienced as water change. That means not enough water where we need it and too much water where we don't. 
and both of these changes will put downward pressure on the quality of water and in the end the quality of the economy and livelihoods. So at Unilever we already set out our climate and nature action plan which includes the action of water and improves resilience through how we source our raw materials, through the application of water stewardship programs and governance around 100 of our most water stressed sites, and through the 1 billion climate and nature fund that we have announced last year. And we're driving innovation on biodegradability in our formulations and supporting social entrepreneurs developing solutions to water scarcity. So we are getting prepared for the 1.2 degrees of global warming that the world is already experiencing today. And as you would expect, we are optimistic about the power of the market to deliver many of the solutions. However, water is a public good, a shared resource and not a private asset. We believe that governments have a unique ability and responsibility to lead here. And we want to see government lead in the development of strong water governance models that involve local communities and other stakeholders in their development. There can be no substitute for that local collaboration and global action. We need government, business, civil society and academia working together to better understand water stewardship and how to integrate it into our global value chains but with a clear, consistent and ambitious set of policies that help us look after our water resources, we can set the world on the right path to increase resilience, equitable outcomes, and create sustainable living for all. Thank you. Oh, actually, I think we have someone on the yeah. John, are you, okay. Hello, I'm John Foley. Chief Executive of M&G, one of the UK's leading international savings and investments groups. As a global investor, I feel honoured to share with you why the water crisis matters so much to us. With more than £360 billion of assets under management, it is our responsibility to consider all long-term risks facing the millions of individuals who entrust their savings to us. Water risk is now rising up our investment agenda. As awareness grows about the material threats to water security and the vital importance of fair access to water. Among other countries, we are major investors in South Africa, where we are already seeing what the future may hold for our planet. As in much of the global south, the South African economy and local communities have already started to suffer the widespread effects of changes in rainfall and temperature due to global warming. Water has become a source of systemic financial risk, but unlike fossil fuels, there's no substitute for it. As global investors, we can and will play our part in channeling investment to projects, businesses and countries which are taking steps to mitigate and adapt to water risks. But we cannot do it alone. Collective action on tackling the water crisis will require leadership from governments in three areas to help make sure investment is going to the right places. Firstly, governments need to embed water within their climate resilience planning, setting a level playing field for how businesses are allowed to use and manage water sustainably, making sure these policies are enforced. Secondly, we need continued investment from governments in public water infrastructure, without which businesses and communities cannot survive. And finally, to help investors like us make the right decisions about where to channel capital, we need to see governments and regulators mandating better disclosures from companies about water use and pollution, just as we're beginning to see on carbon emissions. With this leadership and these actions, we can work together to use investment as a force for good, rewarding responsible water use, addressing water risks, and helping to create a more sustainable world. On behalf of M&G, we look forward to working with you all. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for including us. Uh, my name is Tor van der Brink, and I'm with Heineken. And I'm from the Netherlands, I'm Dutch, um, a country with a rather intimate relationship with water. Most of 
the time we have too much of it and then every now and then we have too little. And as a brewer, we also have a very intimate relationship with water. It is by far the most important ingredient in beer. Beer is basically water, malted barley and hops. Uh, so it's not only the lifeline of humankind and nature on the planet, it's also the lifeline for us as a company. We are still a family controlled company, 157 years old, and we like to say that we think in generations. And if there's one area where we need to think in generations, it is on water, as it is so incredibly important. Uh, as part of our Brewing a Better World 2030 commitments, we made very clear commitments on net zero, but also on water. And let me shortly talk you through our commitments and what we can do and where we feel we need to work together with uh, uh, society around us. So first of all, as a brewer, for every liter of beer, we are using around three, 3.2 liters of water. And there's a huge concerted effort in the industry to reduce that ratio. Over the last decade, we already have reduced it by 30%. Digitizing more and more of our production processes using big data, we're actually able to continuously uh, be more productive in this regard and using industry partners like Ecolab helping us on accelerating in this regard. The second thing which is incredibly important is wastewater and making sure that not only us but everybody treats their wastewater. We are at 97 percent, we're just two, three percent away from 100 percent wastewater treatment wherever we are on the planet. We're in almost 80 uh, countries. Now, with wastewater treatment, there is a very sad thing because we, we basically, at the end of the process, we have this incredible high quality water and then it goes into the sewer or into open water systems where it floods out to rivers and to the ocean. So there's a huge task to be done to look for circular uh, solutions, to see if other businesses or agriculture can use our wastewater um, um, uh, flows. Um, again, something that we cannot do alone. We can reduce, uh, uh, you know, how much water we use, we can treat it, but then we need to work together in the local communities on making sure that that wastewater, that's perfectly fine water, gets reused in, um, uh, in the watershed. The second commitment we have made is around water stressed areas. Out of our 170, 180 breweries around the world, around 30 are in water stressed areas. And that's not because we kind of said, okay, hey, let's go and build a brewery in a water-stressed area. We will not do that. But a lot of these breweries have been built 75 or even 100 years ago. Um, I was um, leading our Mexican operations a couple of years ago where the company has 130 years of history. And some of these breweries now find themselves in, in a very tough environment to operate in. And there we carry extra responsibility. And the commitment we are making is that we are returning 100% of the water we use to the local watershed, predominantly through nature-based solutions. And not easy. That is about restoring uh, marshlands in Spain, that is in the Swan Juan River Basin in Monterrey, northern Mexico. We have uh, joined massive reforestation pro uh, projects. Um, that's not our core business, so we really depend on working with other parties like, for example, the Nature Conservancy. The third commitment uh, that we are now exploring is on what we would call our Scope 3. We have very clear Scope 3 commitments on net zero, on carbon, that is kind of becoming the new normal, on water that is less clear. So that's something that we're really investigating and we would love to work and learn together with, uh, with others. One of the key things we have learned in this regard is the importance of agriculture. Uh, the, the, one of the prior speakers said it's about 70% of the usage of water uh, is through agriculture. And again, us using a lot of agriculture products like barley, we have a big you know, role in that. One of the key things that we are worried about that in a lot of places on the planet, water is for free for the agricultural sector. And we talk a lot about putting a price on carbon. We also really need to make sure that we put a price on water because there's no incentives for a lot of those farmers to become more efficient, to not irrigate, to try to use rain fat. We can do things like develop more, um, you know, less water intense varietals of our barley, but we do need in the end to work together with the agricultural sector. These are very complex, um, uh, you know, challenges. 
You have our commitment on what we control, and you have our commitment to work together to bring some of these things uh, forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We heard from three business leaders, Mark, John, and Dolph, and now it's time to hear from uh, leaders in the, the non-state actor space, uh, additional leaders who are equally important. Now we are going to see a video about the power of wetlands from voices uh, representing local and indigenous communities. Walk with me. 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 Tunafanya kazi kuchunga na kurejesha kitu muhimu katika sayari yetu. Hii ni njia moja wapo mwafaka ya kukabiliana na mabadiliko ya hali ya hewa. We are out here helping something which hugely reduces carbon emission and flooding is a vital for biodiversity and for people to be able to adapt to the changing climate. And this powerful thing is 100% natural. So what is it? Wetlands. 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 These lakes, rivers, Mikokohi, Fevers. They might look calm, but they are very powerful. A wetlands, Usaidi and Yongo Vikuba, they are Madi Naka, Asilimia Arubaini, a Vumbe, Utegemia wetlands. But since 1970s, our third has been destroyed. We are losing the very thing that can help us most. O kuifa di mazingira ya wetlands, yale yale yaribika. Significa que podemos hacer una diferencia inmensa en nuestras emisiones de carbono en los próximos 10 años. It's time for us all to recognize the power of wetlands. Il est temps que les pays, les villes, les entreprises intègrent les zones humides à nos actions. Lutter contre le changement climatique et respecter l'accord de Paris. Sinon, ils nous mettent sur la voie d'un réchauffement climatique mortel. That's not right. Kami, mga wetland ambassadors, uban sa libuan nga kabatan unan sa tibuok kalibutan sa bayan nga nagaliho. They're working to increase the power of wetlands. Tara na, muduyog pa ka mo. Utadiunga nas. Will you join us? Will you join us? Te unes? You just heard here just a couple of voices calling for the protection of wetlands and just to give you a scale of how huge this call is, um, 2,500 young leaders around the world have signed a call to protect and restore wetlands and natural resources. So this is a terrific effort. For the past one and a half years, many water partners uh, have been working together to update, upgrade, and enhance something called the Climate Action, uh, action Pathway for Water. And I'll use this moment to cue the PowerPoint that I prepared. Um, the Climate Action Pathway for Water represents the water community's vision for a climate resilient net zero future by 2050. And we've been using this time to uh, involve as many stakeholders as possible to illustrate, to, to paint what that future would look like. If that PowerPoint can be shown, that would be wonderful. Otherwise, I will direct you to the UNFCCC website where you can take a look at that pathway. Uh, we've got a terrific vision statement that's a, a shorter statement, and you can also check out the longer version of that climate action pathway for water. And now I'd like to invite some very special guests. Um, I'd like to invite Heidi, Christine, Rosh, and Patrick. I believe Rosh is joining us. Patrick is not here with us today, so Rosh is online with us. Welcome. And so I'd like to take uh, this moment, this, this very special occasion, to discuss with you some uh, terrific initiatives, uh, goals that you have set, but also accomplishments 
uh, that have been achieved. So first, Christine, I'll turn to you. Tell us about the success of the water breakthrough that you've been leading for the Race to Zero this year. And if you can allow us a glimpse into your crystal ball for what that future looks like, the, the 2050 future. And what do we have to do? What do water, what does the water sector, what do water companies have to do to arrive at that future? Yeah, thank you so much. A really good question. And thank you for inviting us here today. It's been wonderful to hear those uh, really powerful voices. I'm going to talk about two things really briefly. One, uh, a real success and one, a big challenge ahead to your question. Um, we're incredibly proud to have been working as a partner um, with Race to Zero and that follows the launch of our industry net zero route map, which we're really proud of. Uh, net zero by 2030 on operational emissions and um, we are actually the first sector industrial sector in the UK to make to come up with a, such a bold and detailed plan and one of the first around the world so that has been a big success and that will help deliver net zero water in this critical decade it shows in that route map some of the areas where we're well placed to succeed and also highlights where the challenges remain and we've taken that UK route map and been talking to others all around the world. And in fact, we've now got 26 utilities on board with the Race to Zero. And in all, that covers um, 72 million customers everywhere from UK, Australia, Chile, Brazil, all over. So we're really excited about that. And we hope that the incredible presence that water has had in Glasgow um, will help galvanize more people to get involved. I'll just turn quickly now to one of the challenges. And um, one um, of the big challenges ahead is around the greenhouse gas emissions that are created by the processing and treatment of wastewater. We've heard a little bit about that today, but it's a huge challenge. And that's why today we're launching a global call to action to galvanize more collaboration and research to really solve that big problem because that could make a really big difference. So we're supported by partners on that and partnership is crucial to all of this. Partners in the US, Australia, New Zealand and Europe. And we, our simple call to action really is to get governments and regulators to play a part in mobilizing the private investment that's needed and the policy implementation that's needed in order to support action to solving this uh, process emissions challenge. So there's a need for innovation, development, deployment. There's an awful lot to do. And with the right support from government and regulators, we can make a big difference. A couple of quick things we're also doing. Um, we're going to pull together a research directory of successful projects. We're going to share knowledge and best practice. All of this is going to accelerate the delivering the net zero that we all want. And together, we believe that we can all go further and faster. So that's the big challenge that lies ahead of us, Jennifer. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Before I turn to Heidi, I'll, I'll mix it up and go to Rosh online first. Rosh, thank you so much for joining us. You're joining us from Sydney Water. Um, and please tell us about some of the actions this year that your company has taken to accelerate transformation on climate mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure to, for me to join you this evening, or uh, well, actually I should say this morning for you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm here in my dual capacity as uh, Chief Executive of Sydney Water, but also as Chair of the Water Services Association of Australia. And as Christine said, we have a number of water companies from Australia that have joined the, uh, the Race to Zero, and we are very proud of that. Before I start, uh, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we work, live and learn here in Australia and I want to pay my respect uh, to the elders past and present. So just a few things about, uh, about what we're doing uh, at Sydney Water and we've definitely taken a, a, a very innovative approach uh, to water management to to basically to respond to the, uh, the climate uh, crisis. 
So you, you know that in Australia and New Zealand we are already experiencing the, the impact of extreme weather events. If you just look at the last 20 years, we have experienced uh, two of the worst uh, droughts on record. Uh, we have had extreme floods and heat waves, and I'm pretty sure that everyone has seen the um, pictures of bushfires that we had in the last uh, few summers. And the water industry does really an outstanding job to respond and, and manage these events, but we also know that we, we cannot continue with a business-as-usual approach. So at Senior Water, we are reimagining the way we manage water to ensure our cities are sustainable, resilient and livable for the future generations. So an example is um, what we do in, uh, in Sydney's Western Parkland City, which is one of the, uh, the most um, rapidly urbanising regions in Australia. And, and this is taking an, uh, an integrated approach to water management. And, and by this, I mean not only thinking about what we do as um, just supplying drinking water and wastewater services, but also integrating stormwater and recycled water to, to really create a better environment for our customers. So we've, we've developed new planning tools to, um, to guide, the, to guide the, uh, the, the design of buildings, uh, but also open space, um, streetscapes, green corridors, uh, blue green infrastructure. And, and by um, harvesting and, and using storm water and recycled water, we can really green the city and, and create a, a much cooler uh, environment without uh, heat island effect, and at the same time increase the sustainability of our water resource. I, I could also talk about the um, kind of stormwater channels, the traditional concrete stormwater channel, channels that we are re-naturalizing into wetlands and, and I think the previous video was a, was a very good example of, of, uh, of how you can do stormwater in, in a different way. But um, another very cool project that we are working on is the new uh, international airport that is being built in Western Sydney. And, and this is a pilot to demonstrate that by greening the airport with recycled water and stored water, you can not only save uh, energy uh, with less need for air conditioning in the buildings, but also you can have the aircraft uh, consuming less fuel when they take off simply because the air is cooler. So really for us, uh, it is about integrating the full um, water cycle into the city to make it green, lush, sustainable and, and a place where our customers can live, play and learn. And, and this is how we deliver our vision at Sydney Water, which is to create a better life for our customers. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Roche. And now I'll turn to Heidi. Um, and I'll hand the baton over to you and sort of travel a little bit in time and space. Let's talk about 2022 next year. So what activities, what actions will you take in 2022 to leapfrog conventional paths and help usher uh, the kind of behavioral change that is needed? So I think you, um, you ask a really interesting question there about how to be unconventional and try and think about things differently and that's exactly where we need to be but I'm really proud of where we've managed to get so far. We started as a company being very concerned about this in the early 2000s and since 2008 we've reduced our emissions by 82% um, by a whole range of different activities. One of the main ones being um, the introduction of a technology called advanced anaerobic digestion or as we call it power from poo um, and that made a big difference along with hydro um, and uh, buying all our energy from directly from renewable sources. So we're a long way on our journey and really pleased that the sector has uh, embraced this too and we're aiming towards 2030 for, uh, for the whole sector. I mean, that's just an incredible commitment. And uh, Northumbrian Water is trying to get just a little bit ahead of that with 2027 and 
Um, so we've got that about a last 50 odd uh, thousand tons to, to get rid of. But what we've had to do is think differently, challenge, challenge conventions. So good examples of that would be um, we brought in the first ever use of reed beds to treat water um, sludge in, in Essex. So 16 big reed beds there, a solution that is over 30 to 40 percent more carbon friendly than the ways that we would have normally done things. That's one way of thinking about things differently. We've got carbon champions in our business and we've, in, we've developed a digital twin of the company where we can model carbon and how can we grab just even small amounts in lots of different ways. We're even thinking about it in a way like we might approach safety. In every meeting in our company, we would have a safety share. How could we improve safety? And we're now closing every meeting with a sustainability share and saying, who's got an idea? Who could think about something different? And we just have to keep challenging um, and thinking about things really, really differently. We've, um, we've also, um, we heard there um, Roach speaking about wetlands and nature-based solutions. This is going to be a key part of our future. We've done quite a number of city-based sustainable urban drainage systems and we're looking um, with lots of other people because collaboration is absolutely key to that to do more and more of that in the big cities that we serve in the northeast of England and then perhaps another one that, that people might think about is we've challenged ourselves to for every 60 pence that we spend in every pound we'll spend it locally because we know in that way we will reduce transport we will bring things closer to us so I'd say to everybody, just challenge every single aspect of your performance. Think about it. Collaborate with others. Um, in 2022, that will be the next places that we're going. We've got more solar um, going in next year. We're transferring our fleet to electric or potentially to hydrogen and biomethane. But now it's very much about collaboration, working with other people, working with our supply chain, and seeing what a difference we can yield um, in that way as well. So teamwork guys, um, challenge your thinking, embrace your people and bring them into it. Um, use te new technologies like digital twinning and advanced anaerobic digestion and hopefully like us you can make that dramatic difference and, uh, and the rest of our sector will get there in 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause. And now I'll invite Olga of UNEC to join us on the stage. And Heidi just um, uh, set up the next conversation beautifully because she talked about the power of uh, cooperation and collaboration. Uh, now in this next segment, we want to discuss uh, water for peace and resilience in a changing climate. Um, we want to talk about water as a catalyst for cooperation in times of water scarcity, water insecurity and the need to accelerate action on tra uh, transboundary uh, agreements. So please take the stage. You can actually use the podium if you'd like. This one? The podium. Podium? Yeah. Would you like to first deliver? Um, I would like or? to deliver something, uh, but they told me as I have micro, but, I, but OK. Oh, yeah, sure. Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear friends of water. I'm very happy to be here. I'm here on behalf of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe that I'm proud and honored to lead. Uh, and what has, uh, in short, UNEC common with water? Uh, first of all, we host the Secretariat to, to Water Convention, that is Convention on Transboundary Cooperation on water, International Lakes and transboundary waters. So let me start with three basic facts. And first of all is that water is, as we know, and we hear today, crucial for climate change adaptation and mitigation. Second, water bears an enormous potential for cooperation. However, we don't have enough of that transboundary cooperation. And with that transboundary cooperation, the adaptation would be more and more effective. So what we need is uh, to have more operational arrangements for such transboundary cooperation. And also together with UNESCO, we are together 
co-custodians, so we are reporting on SDG indicator 652, what is on transboundary cooperation. And this is what my presentation will be about. So, ladies and gentlemen, most climate impacts are transmitted through water, uh, triggering, for instance, gla glacial meltings, floods, sea level rise. So, water resources are under unprecedented threat. This year, uh, we could have witnessed devastating floods and droughts. The frequency and severity increases along with water stress and scarcity. And uh, combined with uh, population and economic growth, uh, these pressures can intensify. It, it can intensify tensions over water and make water stress regions more prone to conflict. So it's also political. But I started with bad news. Despite all those bad news, I see also hope. As I told, water bears an enormous potential for cooperation and transboundary or cross-border cooperation. To achieve Paris Agreement, we must mainstream water, as highlighted by the UN Water Policy Brief on climate change on water. And uh, water should be a central element in the nationally determined contributions by individual member states and adaptation strategies by each country. Some statistics now, more than 60% of world's fresh water is shared by two or more countries. Three quarters of the United Nations member states share basins with a neighboring country. Many of the world's largest rivers are transboundary, for example, the Nile, the Congo, the Amazon, and the Mekong. Transboundary cooperation is crucial to address climate change impacts, conserve ecosystems, oceans, and improve water quality. Both water and climate change, they don't know borders. Transboundary cooperation in climate change adoption prevents maladaptation, makes adaptation more effective by sharing data, enlarging the planning space, and sharing costs and benefits. The basin and transboundary dimension should be considered by cities, businesses, and all water managers. In many basins, the need to jointly address droughts and floods was at the origin of the transboundary cooperation, such as in the Senegal River. Basin organizations are increasingly, but not yet sufficiently, addressing climate change. Transboundary adaptation strategies have been developed, for example, in the Danube, Rhine, Lake Victoria, Mekong, Niester, Neman basins. Today, the Mekong River Commission will introduce its adaptation activities demonstrating the important work of basin organizations as agents of peace. Transboundary water agreements create the legal and institutional frameworks that help to manage those share basins, share waters across political borders. Water treaties promote peace, sustainable development, and reduce the risk of conflicts over scarce resources by providing procedural, substantive norms, thus reducing any uncertainty. They provide an enabling environment for investments and monitoring their progress through SDG indicator 652 on transboundary water cooperation is thus very, very important. But reporting this transboundary cooperation, we can see that the world is not on track, unfortunately. And again, a little bit statistics. Worldwide, only 24 out of 153 countries sharing transboundary waters have all day transboundary waters covered by operational agreements for water cooperation. So this number would need to increase by nearly 15 every year to achieve the target until 2030. And progress is urgently required to ensure that all water sharing countries cooperate effectively, fight climate change jointly, and ensure sustainable peace. In addition, another statistics, only 43% of the reported transboundary agreements cover climate adaptation. Several countries have noted the need to update the agreements to include 
climate change. So the Water Convention, serviced by UNEC, provides a crucial legal framework and intergovernmental platform for adapting shared water resources to climate change. Currently counting 46 parties to the Convention, including five from Africa, more than 100 countries participate on the work of the Convention. So the Convention acts as a catalyst for negotiating new and strengthening existing transboundary agreements and uh, institutions as well for improving national <laughs> water governance. The Convention and its task force on water and climate support countries in developing transboundary adaptation strategies and implementing agreed adaptation measures through guidance, projects on the ground, and what is very important, exchange of experience. One example is the global network of the basins working on climate change, coordinated by UNEC and the International Network of Basin Organizations. So we invited today new basins to join the network, and now I look forward to hearing from two examples from the ground. We have NGO Eco Peace from Middle East working in a basin with less advanced cooperation and the Mekong River Commission from Asia with, with advanced cooperation. So, Jana and, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Olga. Um, it's such a pleasure to be joining you here today um, from Jordan one of the most water scarce countries in the world. Um, shared water resources and water diplomacy um, have been our core focus at EcoPeace Middle East. Um, we work with both policy level, um, but pe also with people on ground, the grassroots in communities that share water resources. Um, we work with with them on creating healthy interdependencies, considering the impact of climate change, especially on our scarce water resources in the region. Um, one of the really great achievements we have been able to make, um, considering the amount of advocacy work we do is the example of the recent water agreement reached between Jordan and Israel for Jordan to purchase desalinated water for its additional needs um, from the Mediterranean, from Israel, um, an amount of 50 million cubic meters, um, which is a great way forward for cooperation or showing cooperation between the two countries. Um, since our establishment, we've been focusing heavily on the Jordan River Basin, um, the lower part of the Jordan River, um, which is shared between Jordan, Israel, Palestine. So around two decades of lots of research and advocacy, working with both policy and with communities on ground, we've put all our experience and we produced the first ever regional master plan to achieve sustainable development um, in the Jordan River Basin. If all projects implemented, identified as needed interventions were to be implemented on ground, a set of 127 projects, we'd be able to boost an economy, a poor economy, of a currently 4 billion US dollars in the three countries to a 73 US billion dollars by 2050 if we are able to implement the 127 project. But we as EcoPeace know the huge amount of financial resources required to implement all these projects. So what we're doing and what we've done over the past years is we worked with different donors um, to attract um, and development funds to move forward uh, a set of those projects focusing on uh, climate smart resilience uh, projects, uh, basically. Um, but if we really 
So we've done and we've achieved through our focus um, uh, on ground a lot in terms of uh, focusing on the water sector. But it's time for real meaningful change. And this can only happen if we recognize that we must cooperate and work together, especially cooperating on building healthy interdependencies in a region like ours that is considered one of the most uh, naturally scarce region in terms of our water resources. We must focus in our region um, on the comparative advantages that we have in each of our countries. So we must really work on bringing together comprehensive plans like our proposed Green Blue Deal for the Middle East, a proposed plan for our governments in the region to cooperate on implementing projects that are climate change resilient. Yana, sorry to interrupt you. We do have to move uh, on to the next speaker. Would you like to wrap up in the next couple of seconds? Yes, yes, please. So, I mean, I encourage everyone to look at the proposal of a Green Blue Deal, which talks about projects that are solutions, that are climate change resilient. Projects like the exchange of water and energy between our region. Um, and thank you all very much. We'll give the floor to Dr. Hatta. And Dr. Hatta, come on in. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hata, the CEO of the Mekong River Commission. Secretariat, uh, distinguished participants, uh, colleagues and friends. I have the great pleasure and honor to speak at the Water Action event on behalf of the Mekong River Commission. Despite our region abundance, water resources, water scarcity in Southeast Asia face major challenges because of increased demand, excessive competition, and threats caused by climate change. Every four years, the four leaders of the member state of the Mekong River Commission come together to reaffirm their commitment to cooperate for sustainable and responsible development. In their latest commitment, the single declaration of 5th April 2018 is the recognition of the environmental and social challenges caused by climate change. Guided by the single declaration, the MRC has produced comprehensive assessments of the potential impact from the climate change on water resources and related sector throughout the basin. Those assessments highlight the increased frequency, duration, intensity of flood and drought in the next 10, 30 years. And to cope with these ongoing and future impacts, we have devised a new 10-year basin development strategy 2021-2030, approved by the NRC member country Council of Ministers. The strategy features as one of five strategic priorities under the heading Increasing Resilience to Climate Risk, Extreme Flood and Droughts, which incorporate climate resilience into the 2040 Basin Visions. Some of the way the Member States have agreed to address those issues include, for example, more active regional planning that identifies and evaluates solutions to work water security challenges achievable with cooperation between countries, including nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based adaptation. Greater coordination of water infrastructure operation, including transboundary operation and improved data and information sharing. The MRC is also supporting member countries in both mitigation and adaptation challenges. For example, with regard to climate change mitigation, 
we are working with the member country to identify a more optimal and sustainable development pathway. This includes evaluating the relationship between water and energy sector plans and identification of alternative development scenario that may increase benefit and reduce costs. Dr. Hatta, we'd kindly like to ask you to wrap up your remarks in a couple of seconds. Thank you very much. On adaptation climate change, our focus is on transboundary cooperation to manage the potential impact of increased flood and drought. Information organizations like ours are usually challenged by the intersector measures of the climate change threat and the need for policy responses that cut across the water, food, and energy nexus. We have to adapt with the new climate reality with the approach which are flexible and responsive to changing conditions. This is because the issue of climate change is known that any single country can solve by itself. It requires stronger cooperation and border commitment from every country. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let, let me quickly wrap up. Just few information. So you have seen some examples. And other examples from other basins will be presented during the Cooperation Day at the Water and Climate Pavilion on November 12th. So now we see how political will, the cooperation is important. And now I will tell the, the mantra, governments, private sector, civil society. Why civil society? Because we need you uh, in cases where the political progress is uh, quite difficult. Uh, last note goes to the, the lack of lack of funding is a major challenge for many basin organizations. So I would like to call here on international financial institutions, uh, private sector, climate funds, and other to recognize and invest in transboundary climate change adaptation. So let me finish here. Uh, we will have in 2023 the United Nations Water Conference as the future, also the future COPs will provide uh, crucial milestones and uh, I look forward to engagement of all relevant actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga. And now I invite Marie-Laure Vercambra from the French Water Partnership and the rest of our panelists to join the stage. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Marie-Laure Vercamp. I am the Director General of the French Water Partnership, a multi-stakeholder uh, platform uh, gathering 200 um, uh, stakeholders of the French uh, water sector. Um, very happy to moderate this segment. Um, and uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Stéphane Payet, who is the Deputy Director um, of the Department in charge of the environment, environment and Climate at the French Ministry of uh, Europe and Foreign Affairs. Um, and Mr. Nabil Ben Katra, um, the Executive Secretary of the um, Observatory of Sahel and Sahara. Um, so we're here to talk about uh, uh, the funding of adaptation of water adaptation in the field of water specifically. And, um, and also to talk about uh, an initiative uh, that was launched at uh, COP21 uh, that was um, 100 um, uh, water and adaptation project uh, for Africa. Mr. Payet, um, what is it that continues to slow down action and how can we speed up the development of adaptation projects in the water sector? Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation and give me the, the, the floor Thanks. on behalf of the, the French government. So water is a, is a strategic sector at the center of, uh, of many climate issues. And we often talk about risks such as floods, droughts, tornadoes, but uh, there are also the needs for, for drinking water the man management of sanitation networks and addressing water management is linked 
also to uh, other related issues such as uh, land use planning, preservation of biological ecosystems, human development, and also pandemics and transmission of a virus. So France is uh, involved in water management and the fight against climate change at the international level. And its international strategy for water and sanitation, which was adopted in 2020, brings its contribution to the achievement of SDG 6, including its targets dedicated to sustainable and integrated water resources management. L'Agence Française du Développement, the French Development Agency, finances a higher number of projects around the world through the ADAPT Action approach, for instance, and one of its important components uh, aims to improve the management of water resources. Uh, for example, in Senegal, there is a project of protection of the water resources of the Put catchment area through nature-based solutions. The mobilization of many actors to develop cross-cutting approaches within water and climate networks is therefore essential. This is why France has supported from the beginning the global alliances for water and, and climate. There are many ambitious water-related adaptation projects which are planning actions at basin level, a scale highly relevant for this transversal cross-sectoral approach. But projects are not getting finance in an efficient way because climate finance access was primarily designed for single state access and not for transboundary basin organizations gathering different countries. Thus, uh, in our views, there is a gap between from one part the financial donors and the other part the project holders for two main reasons. The first the project holders are not familiar with the complex landscape of climate finance and its myriad of donors and complex procedures. And second uh, reason, uh, donors are often unfamiliar with the methodology of the Basin approach, which is the approach defended by, by France, supported by France. For projects uh, covering transboundary rivers or lakes, processing submissions in, is particularly complicated. So our role is to create that link between project holders and, and donors. And the 100 Water and Climate Project Initiative aims precisely, precisely at filling this gap through project incubation and technical, technical and financial assistance is provided to actors in order to facilitate project development and access to, to climate finance. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to turn to you, Mr. Benkatra. Um, so again, you represent the Observatory for Sahel and Sahara. Um, we'll talk a little more about the, the, this initiative later, but I wanted to ask you, um, what was your vision when it comes to funding adaptation projects um, in the field of water? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the organizers. And um, first of all, I want to say that I come from Africa, from North Africa, where we speak Arabic and then French. And uh, so English is not my language, but time is for adaptation. And we do adapt and uh, it is for action. Um, as you may know, uh, the Sahara and Sahel Observatory is created uh, 30 years ago and our main work was on the establishment and the um, uh, implementation of monitoring systems and ob observation system to understand the situation on natural resources and uh, water uh, also. And um, during our mission and our programs, uh, we have to uh, implement so this kind of solutions to understand what's happening on field. So we developed indicators on uh, the situation of natural resources, but also we developed uh, indicators on uh, social and economic issues. And what we understand is that there is a big demand on uh, concrete actions on field to support and to help populations suffering from 
climate change um, this uh, and nowadays. So uh, since uh, seven or uh, eight years, we uh, managed to be accredited by the Adaptation Fund, and also we are accredited by the uh, Green Climate Fund on 2017. Uh, so our vision is to support our country members to solve many of the problems they are facing uh, related to uh, water. Uh, in Africa, uh, we can say that, that there is huge amounts of water. We have underground waters, mainly in North Africa, and we have surface water in uh, Central and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and even in uh, Southern Africa. But the issue is how to mobilize this water. We have uh, big weaknesses uh, regarding the mobilization of water at different levels. Uh, at institutional level, uh, I mean the capacities of the uh, technical institutions needs to be uh, developed and also at uh, field level where the populations need support and need help to mobilize and to valorize this water. So uh, the issue of developing projects on uh, water and climate are very, very important for the development of our uh, region, uh, Africa mainly, where the um, economic and social development is uh, mainly based on the natural resource management and uh, mainly on water. So that's why uh, OSS is giving a lot of importance to this issue and that's why we are working with our country members and also with our partners to develop, and we'll see it later, projects and activities related to water resources. Thank you. Um, I see that we have uh, just uh, five more minutes uh, left for this uh, little segment. So I wanted to, to use that time um, to, use me, to ask Mr. Payet um, if uh, he wants to say a little more about this um, water and climate projects incubation um, initiative and maybe tell us where things stand um, and what are the prospects for it. And then maybe I'll ask you, uh, Mr. Ben um, um you know, what is your role? How are you really getting involved in that specific initiative? So, so very briefly, th this initiative wa was launched in 2017 at the first One Planet Summit, which was organized by the United Nations, the World Bank, and, and France. And it was uh, proposed by the International Network of Basin Organizations as part of uh, the glo global alliances for, for water and, and climate. Uh, so its ambition is to, to build a, a continuum between different types of financial mechanism. Uh, those, uh, those mechanisms uh, which provide sea fundings of a, a few tens of, of thousands of dollars and, and, and those who implement uh, multi-million dollar projects. And so this leverage effort of one to, to 100 can really accelerate the climate actions. So since it, it's launching, the, the initiative receives support from the, the World Bank and the collaboration with the African Development Bank. And in 2019, uh, they published together a, a practical guide uh, with recommendation on how to, to develop and finance bankable projects for adaptation and, and transboundary basins. 50 projects uh, are already being supported, covering 42 African countries for, for the benefit of uh, the, the 300 million people whose livelihoods depend directly on the, on the basins targeted for, for project incubation. So you can see cases of incubation displayed on, on on the screen? No, there is no, no screen on this. Okay. Um, and so in March 2022, uh, the initiative will be presented as a, a flagship uh, action of the World uh, Water Forum in, in Dakar in March. And we are looking forward to, to the incubation of uh, as a batch of 50, 50 projects. And of course, I invite uh, donors and, and project holders to, to approach them in order to, to join the initiative. I mean, the more we will be involved in, in, in this uh, building project, uh, the more the water issue will be considered at its right uh, rank in, in the international agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Do you, um, uh, Mr. Bancatra, you want to be specific about the territory that your uh, organization is covering in terms of action? 
and, and maybe then your role uh, in that uh, initiative. Thank you. Uh, OSS is uh, an intergovernmental organization uh, where we have 26 country members from Africa, North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, and Central Africa. And uh, also we have country members from North, French, uh, France, uh, Italy, Germany, Luxembourg, uh, uh, Canada, and so on. And, uh, but uh, OSS is not only working on just the country members. So now we have projects uh, financed, by, for example, by the Adaptation Fund in uh, Austral uh, Africa, in Angola, Namibia, w which are not yet members of OSS. So we don't have a restrictive approach. And this vision is also in our manner of dealing of water uh, issues. We don't uh, have a sectoral approach. Our vision is to integrate water in all our activities, uh, to integrate water in all our programs and projects. Because now we don't have donors specifically for water program, but now we have the Adaptation Fund, we have the GCF, that can finance a lot of activities related to water. And now we have five projects in Africa financed by the Adaptation Fund, and in all, uh, uh, five ongoing projects, and in all these projects, we have a water component. We work on the implementation of uh, early warning system, drought early warning system, um, hazard early warning system. We work also on uh, um, the ca capacity building of the institution, of the population. Uh, we work also on ad concrete adaptation actions on field. Uh, also regarding the, to, to, to try to stop the uh, impact of uh, inundation, and, uh, but also to adapt to um, drought. So uh, this is our approach, and this is what OLSS is promoting. And what we need is to valorize this vision, is to valorize this approach, uh, in this uh, program where we have to develop 100 climate and water uh, projects. Uh, I think that the organizers are saying to me that we have to stop, but we have a lot of things to say about this issue, and I invite you to visit our website to know more about OSS and more about what we are doing on water and climate. Thank you. Thank you, Marie Laura. Um, before I introduce Kate Lam, my colleague uh, Kate, um, it gives me special, special honor and privilege to lend this platform to elevating the voices of local communities and indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples. Um, thanks to the Equi uh, UNDP Equator Prize, um, let's listen in to the voices of the prize winners. Change is happening. But we see something else. We are going to be able to We are going to nous assurons l'avenir de nos grands singes et de nous-mêmes. We are reversing poverty 
while staying true to our culture. Nuestras comunidades están trabajando juntas a través de prácticas ancestrales y sustentables defendiendo la vida y el territorio. Manteniendo vivo el conocimiento tradicional a través de nuestra relación con la naturaleza, generando puestos de trabajo bajo el liderazgo de mujeres y recibiendo los beneficios justos por nuestros productos. <tose> We are a solution to our climate crisis. Protegemos nuestra tierra local e indígena. By co-managing 26,000 square kilometers of boreal forest. Utan primar, saluas tu pluribu kilometer persegi. Salva guardando 20,000 kilometers cuadrados de selva primaria. And as equal partners, we are helping nature thrive while keeping carbon in the ground. Custodiamos el 80% de la biodiversidad del mundo. Nuestra mayor riqueza es nuestra sabiduría y nuestro conocimiento colectivo. La partagé es nuestra cultura, nuestro métier. Somos indígenas. We are protecting and restoring our planet. Our lives. Y somos la última generación que puede resolver esta emergencia. We are the Fusuka Dene First Nation. Alianza Save. Nationali Masai Conservancy. Israel Tatam Rayana Chape. Mujeres y Ambiente. Mohau. Comunidades Uche. Y sauvage y la forêt depende de nos bouquets. Kami Poma. Orum Sewa. Masara Katada. Taman Nacional. Conviértense en nuestros aliados. On travaille ensemble. Somos la solución. La Para la prosperidad. Naturaleza para la vida. Powerful stuff, right? My goodness, I'm. Um, I have to. I'm quite an emotional person after a year and a half of working with the climate champions in CDP, um, and it gives me a, a huge amount of pride and pleasure and honour to be here to be able to bring these voices into this space. As we said before at the opening statement, we're hoping that all participants today will open their hearts and open their minds and be prepared to be the change that we need to see. So we've heard this morning already about the, the need for change, right? We've heard from an amazing scientist, Alan Hubbard, um, a glaciologist, about the, the, what the science is telling us. We've heard from a range of communities about the fact that they need this change to happen last week, today, and tomorrow. And we're moving into the segment now, which is really focused on those activities and those actions that are bringing about those changes. And so I'm really excited to be able to host this final segment of the day. I hope you're all still with us. Um, and I know it's quite warm in here, so you might want to feel free to stand up, take a bit of a shake around if you need to, to waken yourself up a little bit. So I'm, uh, my name is Kate Lamb, by the way, if you don't know who I am. Um, and I'm going to read from my notes because we've been doing a lot of preparation and not a lot of preparation to, to, to speak eloquently without them. Apologies. I'm here to introduce the first segment, 
a segment titled Systems Change to Scale Urban Water Resilience. We're taking you into the cities, both large and small, that are dotted across the world. They, many of them, are on the front line of the climate and water crisis. A new generation of water programs will bring together water, climate and poverty challenges under the same roof and support resilient development for all. Programs such as the Resilient Water Accelerator and the Africa Urban Water Resilience Initiative aim not only to deliver resilient water infrastructure, but to also support the data, expertise, planning, finance and organisational structures required to ensure and expand water security sustainably. In addition, these initiatives will fix underlying problems in the preparation for future climate threats. And so it gives me great pleasure to please welcome our, our, our panelists up to the stage while I introduce their names. Unfortunately, Mayor Prudence is unable to join us today, which is a real shame. We were really um, excited to be bringing uh, the voice of, of the Rwandan people into this space. But please hold them in your thoughts while our wonderful okay. panelists uh, speak to us today. The first we're going to hear from is Hassan Jahan, the country director of WaterAid in Bangladesh. And then we'll hear from Rogier Vandenberg uh, from WRI. And sorry, Mayor Constant, you are on the next panel, so you may sit down again. <laughs> we'll give you a prompt when it's ready. Uh, so please welcome our speakers. And um, Hassan, it's over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to the organizers for organizing such a wonderful event, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Throughout this week, I have been talking about the challenges that the world is facing, in particular, the communities in Bangladesh are facing. Climate change is a reality in Bangladesh. I want to reiterate that so that you understand what the challenges people are facing in Bangladesh. Increased frequency, and intensity of natural disasters like flood, cyclone, and other extreme weather events, putting the water security at great risk. Lack of infrastructures and fundings are making the situation even worse. Yet, these people are surviving with courage with whatever they have. Leading WaterAid Bangladesh's program as the country director, I take the pride to say that I work for these people these people who are bold, inspiring, and optimistic. Let me share a few examples of Bangladesh. People in the coastal belt are suffering from not having safe water, drinkable water, because of the salinity in water. Due to frequent disasters, their regular wash facilities, wash means water supply, sanitation, and hygiene, wash facilities get washed away, Water Aid supported them with rainwater harvesting and other resilient alternative wash facilities. But they need innovative and more sophisticated approaches and resilient infrastructure to withstand the impacts of climate change. For this, the flow of money needs to be increased to meet the needs and expectations of the communities. No doubt that we need new approaches to address the water challenges to ensure that these approaches can secure much needed investment from climate finance and other sources such as private investment uh, and lastly we need to make every million count. The Resilient Water Accelerator is an exclusive initiative that brings together a number of partners including WRI and the British and the Bangladesh governments, and so, uh, soon we are hoping to, that government of Rwanda will also join us. It aims to target those areas which are more vulnerable to develop comprehensive water programs. These programs aim to ensure that the climate change impacts impacted vulnerable communities have clean and sufficient water, and the water resources are boosting the ecosystem. To speed up these programs and secure funding, the accelerator will bring the governments, experts and communities together to gather data and assess the climate risk 
and threats to water. Based on the data and analysis, we will work with the local communities and authorities to design the program. We will reach out to the entrepreneurs and financial institutes to get the money flow into the system. Most importantly, we will ensure that through this work, we strengthen the communities to build their resilience to respond to the next challenges. I appreciate the sheer sense of mission and ambition in the room, and I look forward to working with many of you as, it take, as we take it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. And Roger, may, may I please introduce you and uh, hand, hand over the panel to you? Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Just raise uh, that up. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. It's like being on the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> Thank, thanks, for, thanks for having me here, and, uh, and thanks, Hassan, for, 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 for your presentation on the Resilient Water Accelerator. My name is Rogier van den Berg. I'm really happy to be here to explain a little bit on what we are doing with our Urban Water Resilience Initiative. Um, it's very complementary to what has just been presented. The Af Af Africa Urban Water Resilience Initiative is focusing on cities and city regions in, in Africa. In that sense, we are really happy to partner uh, with WaterAid. We are also very happy to partner with the African Development Bank in this, uh, in this context. So why do we focus on, 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 on cities? And I think that's very important to understand. Rapid growth, uh, we see doubling of the population by 2050. Um, by already by 2030, the demand for water is three times as high as it was in 2005. So there's a huge water scarcity um, and a real challenge um, uh, to overcome. Second, cities have an important role and they are a driver for change. They have an important role in actually managing water. Water that's usually managed much more at the national level. There's a huge opportunity to bring cities into position. They're actually on the front line of facing climate change. And with the right vision and support, cities have the potential to play a crucial role in safeguarding their populations. Um, it's a pity that uh, Mayor Pudans uh, of uh, Kigali is not here because um, some of the work that we're doing uh, with the Urban Water Resilience Initiative actually is happening in Kigali. Um, so, what are the three things that are in the in three important components of, of what we're doing? Um, first of all, we're looking at a kind of a new, more holistic way for African cities to build water resilience. And we do this with three things. One is ground truthing and developing a methodology. And that's what we're currently doing uh, with our urban water resilience assessment, assessments in six African cities in partnership with Resilient Cities Network, Arab, and the Resilient Shift. The work and methodology will really create a foundation for cities to assess current and future water challenges and resilience action plans. So priorities, where do we need to move, where do we need to invest in. And we plan to scale this work to at least 25 cities in the coming decade. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we're doing is galvanizing an Africa-led movement around shifting the practice. We are working towards developing an African Urban Water Resilience Agenda 2030 that lays out key principles and priorities for shifting how we manage water in cities across the continent. And this is going to play a role, an important role, a call for action, a call to action to national, local authorities, to financial institutions to really work differently and bring resilience at the center. And also to work differently bringing water management, wash, and what resource manager man, by management closer together. The last thing that we're doing, and that's not important, we talked about, we heard about the flow of finance. We're developing a catalytic fund to ensure that resilient urban water projects, such as watershed restoration, nature-based solutions, small-scale urban water access and sanitation project, get connected to available financing. And with doing that, with developing that pipeline of projects we can unleash billions in untapped public and private sector financing. We're working in close collaboration with the African Development Bank, with the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, as well as with WaterAid and the partners in the Resilient Water Accelerator. So with these three things, and then I close, a new methodology, a holistic methodology that we're testing right now, that we're working on in six cities, with an Africa-led movement on developing that practice shift 
for water management, and the third, a catalytic pond. We're laying the groundwork for making the right kind of investments, the right kind of investments that help to build the foundation for resilience with cities at the core. Thank you very much, and uh, looking forward to, to work uh, together with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's really great to hear that the action is underway and we're finding opportunities to find new sources of funding that will help those most vulnerable uh, to changes in climate. Now, while I'm speaking, I would like my next uh, panel to join uh, us on the stage. That's, that's you, Mayor Constant, and Samuela uh, Gida from the International Water Association. It gives me really great pleasure to introduce this initiative. It's an exciting one uh, with a really great title. Uh, it's, we're launching today the, the 50 to 1 billion campaign. This is an initiative that has set to really trigger a transformation in a large proportion of the global population. And it's being delivered through water. And so Samuel is going to talk to us today about the project itself. Um, and then we'll have um, Marta Colette from Aguas Andinas join us as our main uh, speaker also on the, uh, on the agenda today. Thank you. Over to you, Samuela. Yes, first of all, thank you, Kate. Um, it's so nice to, to be here and to share the stage with such amazing women. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if we talk about what is the role of the water sector in, re in uh, delivering re re resilience for people and, and places, um, we know that uh, um, urban water management is uh, one of the um, urban services that is most impacted by, um, the, uh, by, by climate change. So um, this threatens the capacity of the service providers to um, deliver safe water, protect environment, people and assets from flooding and droughts. So utilities need to increase the um, re resilience to the impact um, of climate change um, to improve or maintain service level. So in particular, um, water utilities um, are fundamental for their city's climate adaptation strategy, uh, but they can also contribute up to 50% uh, of their city's green greenhouse gas emission. So, regard so what are the opportunities? Utilities now can be um, guided towards um, uh, water and energy eff efficiency as well as mitigating greenhouse gas e emission. At uh, um, IWA, we have been working with uh, um, GIZ on the uh, water and wastewater companies for the climate mitigation project. And the aim has been to use greenhouse gas emission reducing technology to improve carbon balance uh, of water and wastewater companies while um, maintaining or even improving service level and cost effectiveness. Um, so following the momentum created by the Wacklin project, we started the IWA Climate Smart Utility Initiative, which uh, um, aims at assisting um, these companies in improving their climate resilience by adapting to climate change. So the IWA Climate Smart Utilities Initiative is addressed or um, engages sorry, um, utilities all over the world of all size and locations. And uh, it builds on uh, knowledge exchange, experience exchange, and recognition of good practices. Now, the IWA Climate Smart Utility I I Initiative, CDP, and Aqua Sandinas are partnering to become an initiative of the Race to Resilience um, with the 50 to 1 billion campaign, which is um, targeted to the largest 50 water businesses in the world. This partnership is a catalyst to support all utilities by leveraging on the experience and knowledge of the world's top 50 water businesses. So this initiative will help utilities set and achieve their targets for greenhouse gas reduction and also for high performing system in the face of the local climate change context. Thank you, Samuela. And I think it's worth sharing with the audience that those 50 companies that we could easily fit just in this one room. Um, I hope that's not feedback from my own mic <laughs> or my tummy rumbling, perhaps. Uh, but the, the 50 utilities that we're targeting as part of this campaign serve over 1.2 billion people worldwide. 
and the, the power that those institutions hold is, is really, really exciting. Um, so I'm going to bring in um, uh, Marta Colette Gonzalo, who is our lovely CEO of Aguas Andinas. Thank you for joining us, uh, Marta. We're really, really pleased that your connection has worked and, and that you're, you're here with us live and direct, not quite in 3D, of course, but maybe next year. Um, so can you tell us why Aguas Andinas is supporting this campaign? Hello, hello everybody. It's my pleasure to greet you from Santiago de Chile and be part of this dialogue on this day of water at COP26. I'm sharing with you the journey that Aguas Andinas has followed to face mitigation and resilience measures on climate change. Aguas Andinas is based in the metropolitan region of Santiago de Chile, where we provide environmental services to about 8 million people through the production and distribution of drinking water and wastewater collection and treatment. Chile is one of the countries most impacted by climate change. We are aware that this is, this is not a temporary situation, but a new condition that is strongly affecting the availability of natural resources, with being water one of the most impacted in Santiago. We also think that this climate change emergency must be addressed by society as a whole. And we, as companies, have an unavoidable role. It's necessary to take long-term action now, to have more resilient and prepared cities in such adverse conditions. In this context, we took a serious commitment to fight climate change both with mitigation measures and adaptation initiatives. Concerning mitigation, we were the first water company in the world to set the carbonization objectives with scientific standards to fulfill the ambition of the United Nations and achieve 1.5 degrees. With this, we avoid the emission of 76,000 metric tons of CO2 per year. To achieve this ambition, we have developed different work focuses, also aligned with Chile's commitment on carbon neutrality by 2050. For instance, our last tender for the supply of energy considered 100% of renewable energy. But we also request the use of these sources in the construction of our new infrastructure. But we know that this is not enough. Climate change also means more frequent extreme weather events causing a risk of service continuity. To avoid this, we have designed an ambitious plan to increase resilience, giving a 34 hour supply autonomy to Santiago. This was achieved thanks to the construction and operation of our tanks in Pirque, a big scale infrastructure accumulating one 1,500 million liters, ensuring a reliable drinking water supply. One of the projects that better reflects our commitment to sustainability is our biofactories, where based on circular economy principles, we transform our wastewater treatment plants into factories able to produce new resources, clean water, biofertilizers, biogas, and energy. This project was awarded a prize at COP24 for its contribution to planetary health. And thanks to the biofactories, we can now count on new water resources coming from the reuse of treated water, which will be a real and strategic solution to face the extreme drought currently affecting Santiago de Chile. Well, to conclude, we have a huge challenge in front of us, which is to continue increasing our resilience. Companies can play a key role in this task, affecting all people's life and planet health. That's why we encourage other companies, regardless of their activity, to join Risk to Zero and Risk to Resilience campaign, and of course, 50 to 1 billion campaign. Thanks to all. Wonderful. Thank you, Marta. It's really great to hear the exciting actions underway. Now we're going to go from Chile all the way back to Louisiana. 
to the City of Gretna and Mayor Constant, thank you for joining us today. Thank you why, for me. why is an initiative such as this that would enable more resilient water supplies to cities obviously uh, vital to, to a city like Gretna? You know, a small municipality like the City of Gretna um, is incredibly dependent on resiliency at this time. It's uh, more evident today than ever before. We living today through um, Hurricane Ida uh, restoration at this point. But along that Mississippi River corridor, which we are a component of that, um, there are over 50 cities and um, over 20 million people that drink surface water from the Mississippi River. So to my community, it's incredibly important to understand what the need is um, in future resilience of infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, water and sewer infrastructure, um, the critical components of what we need for daily living to sustain our, our you know, way of life. Um, our cities draw over 900 million gallons of surface water from the river every day. And then there's a, an, on top of that, 90 billion is drawn from agriculture, from um, corporate. And, and so the critical need of that river and what it means to us um, is so important. So today we do things like in green infrastructure programs, how we retain our water. Because in Louisiana, we have to learn how to live with water. Um, it's not um, anything that we're going to pipe in concrete into a system that's sustainable. Um, so we are, we are doing these green infrastructure projects as we speak, creating bioswales, creating retention ponds, so that our infrastructure that is now over hundreds of years old, that is compromised, um, can be able to um, deal with that water in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, doing things uh, as we've always done things in drainage and infrastructure isn't going to work moving forward, right? And so doing things collaboratively, as been discussed so many times over and over, is critical. Um, as an example, we signed a memorandum of understanding this morning, MRCTI did, with M INBO, mm -hmm. so that we can come together with other organizations to create and reach shared developments that make sense um, for our communities. Um, it is um, totally um, understandable, right, that drinking water <coughs> should be our top priorities, um, especially in North America, where maybe we've taken clean water for granted for so, so long. Um, and we're understanding that we've got to do things in a different way to become more resilient. And these projects are on the ground today. And as a mayor in a small municipal government, what we need to do and what we're continuing to do is educate people so that we can tell them this is what we do as government. This is what's so important, but this is what you can do in your own home, in your own property. We can talk about the things that they can do to conserve water, um, to use rain barrels, to use things that seem so, um, I don't know, just uh, elementary, right? But globally, it makes such a difference. And I think we understand that uh, in the Mississippi River Valley now, how important and dependent we are on each other. Because what happens in the northern part of America, we deal with in the southern part of America. Two hours away from where my municipal government is, is really the gateway to America. I'm two hours away from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we're more vulnerable there than probably in most parts of the country. So we understand that we need to collaborate and come together because what we, what we deal with is truly something we have no control over, right? Mm -hmm. It's happening in Northern America at the, at the mouth of the Mississippi, at the headwaters of the river. So that's truly important to us. So, uh, that's very obvious. Thank you, Mayor. It's very kind for you to share those words with us. And, uh, Samuela, we heard from Mayor Constant that basically the time for business as usual approaches to water management is over and we need new approaches. So why should we be looking ahead uh, with regard to the 52 billion campaign? What should we be expecting this time next year in COP27? Yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, so I think that following the momentum created by COP26, um, 2022 will see more water utilities and companies doing the effort to become climate smart. On the IWA side, we will see our partnership with CDP and Aquas and Dinas evolving and the climate smart recognition program and the 52 billion campaign become more concrete 
and uh, hopefully we will be able to drive and inspire change and uh, maybe present some su successful actions at the IWA World Water Congress and the exhibition which will happen in um, Copenhagen in September 2022. So um, if we think about what non-state actors can do, they, uh, I think they can definitely contribute to the discussion. They can be more actively involved and they can encourage or even demand the state actors and, uh, to take practical actions to become more um, climate smart. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And please join me in thanking our participants and uh, keep your eyes open for this important initiative in the year ahead. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now going to move on to the next action-oriented segment of the day. I'm not quite sure why I'm walking over there. Uh, I will stay here. Um, this is uh, another new initiative. There's a number of them. We're, we're putting a barrage of, of activity your way at the moment. Um, and that's on purpose. It's because we want to send a loud resounding signal to the negotiators and governments that are attending today and other non-state actors, so basically anybody else that isn't a central government. The action is underway, that non-state actors, businesses, financial institutions, civil society, young people, old people are doing their part in solving the global water crisis and the climate crisis and that therefore together we can uh, move in a more ambitious uh, pathway to deliver the outcomes that we're seeking. So on that front, it gives me great pleasure to announce our next initiative, which is the Glasgow Declaration for Fair Water Footprints. And we need fair water footprints for effective climate change mitigation and adaptation. The commitment itself, the declaration, <clears throat> which has already been signed by 28 institutions from governments and from civil society and from business and from finance. These institutions uh, represent 180 million people and $4.1 trillion of national GDP. The commitment that they've signed today, literally this morning in the, in the, the green room, commits each one of those organizations to, by 2030, ending the abuse of water that pushes people towards climate vulnerability across their supply chains. And it gives me a real honor to welcome our first signatory who has just walked in the room and about to join us on stage. Uh, we have the, <coughs> excuse me, the Honorable Lord Goldsmith, um, who is going to talk to you briefly about, please do, Sam, about why the UK government has signed this declaration and the steps that we can take within the country in order to move the, the declaration from rhetoric to reality. Over to you, Lord Goldsmith. Thank, thank you so much. Sorry, it felt a bit disruptive there. <laughs> Not at all. Okay, thank, thank you very much, and thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for having me here. Um, I think most people probably know fully why we are here, but it is worth reminding ourselves that over 40% of Europe's water footprint lies outside of its border. Half of the UK's footprint is from, we believe, unsustainable sources, uh, and that our citizens, your clients, um, our voters, your investors, are demanding now that we get serious and that we fix this problem, and clearly we have to. We know that globally extracting and processing resources contributes roughly half of total greenhouse gas emissions, as well as around 90% of the biodiversity loss that's uh, blighting the world, as well as water stress. And we know that investors and multinational corporations influence as much as 70% of the world's water use and employ one out of every five of the global workforce, much of that in places that are most affected uh, by the water and climate crisis that's hitting the world's poorest people first and hardest. So consumer countries around the world really do urgently need to look at their globalized supply chains across every sector uh, and to work with businesses, with financial institutions, civil society around the world to reduce water stress at the point of production, especially in those increasing uh, drought prone areas. And that's our approach in the UK. It's been our approach as part of our 25 year environment plan, uh, um, building on our uh, experience taking on forest risk commodities. And we're, we're currently introducing legislation, a due diligence legislation to require big businesses who import commodities to demonstrate that they have not imported or not importing commodities that are grown at the expense of illegally deforested land. And that principle of addressing our international footprint is absolutely central if we want to tread more lightly 
uh, around the world. And of course, many of you have been pioneering the solutions that we need for decades now, from mapping groundwater in Malawi, and I think we're going to hear from Malawi shortly, uh, to more sustainable agriculture in Peru. But we need a, a global effort for fair water footprints, and our shared vision has to be about zero pollution of water, a sustainable extraction and equitable allocation of water, safe water, sanitation and hygiene for workers, better planning for droughts and floods, uh, changing weather, water conflict, and a solid commitment to protecting and restoring the natural systems for which there can be no substitute from rainforests to the great mountain water towers. Um, we know that nature-based solutions offer so much potential in this uh, area that we're discussing today of water, whether it's controlling floods or preventing droughts or providing resilience for communities in vulnerable hotspots. But despite the really gigantic contribution they can make, water or nature-based solutions generally receive a tiny fraction of global climate attention and global climate finance. And I do think if there's one really big thing that's changed as a consequence of our coming together here in Glasgow, it's that. I think that the nature taking second place in the margins of the margins of the margins is no longer going to happen. Nature's front and foremost, foremost of the COP that we are delivering, and I don't see that changing. Ultimately, we've got to get to a point where fair water footprints are the norm, and, and that means governments giving the, the front runners the, the clarity that they need to set the pace, uh, but it also means businesses demonstrating real leadership, uh, likewise our great universities and researchers providing the evidence that's needed, and civil society really holding everyone's feet to the fire. If you look at the promises that have been made over the last couple of days on nature generally, it's a pretty impressive package. It does represent a turning point. It certainly points us in the right direction and takes quite a few big steps in that direction. But it's only going to matter, and it's only going to be meaningful if those promises are kept, and that's really where civil society comes in. And the good news, I think, is that momentum is building really fast. We, we, we first challenged uh, countries, including ourselves, as it happens, to work together more effectively in August. And then in October, over 120 participants from more than 20 governments, over 30 businesses, numerous organizations came together for three hours to work out how we can achieve that. And from that, we've reached a point today where we're able to launch the Fair Water Footprints Declaration. And I'm proud that the UK is one of the first signatories, uh, alongside friends from seven countries so far, seven countries and counting, uh, as well as 20 other organizations, including businesses and civil society organizations. And the action that we are now committed to um, really matters. Um, by making our commitment public, I hope others will be inspired to join us. And I really invite all of you to join us in committing to set targets for progress throughout the decade, to mobilize the policy that's needed, the finance that's needed, in order to meet those targets, and to make ourselves accountable for achieving our shared goals. So today is about getting the ball rolling. Uh, it's all happened very, very quickly. It's been, I think, a real jump in the right direction. I really take my hat off to the organizers. Um, I think real progress has been made, but we've got to make the most of COP27 in Egypt and the UN Water Summit in 2023 as well. Those are key moments for us to demonstrate that that momentum continues. Uh, and it's up to us, all of us, to, to make this the decade that really counts, the moment where we reconcile the way we live, our economies, our lives, with the natural world around us. Uh, and it, that is the fundamental challenge we're here to address at COP, and it's, that is the only way we're going to guarantee a future for our future generations. Uh, we've got everything we need to achieve that, but the bit that's been missing for so long is the political will. We don't need to be particularly clever about it. Everything that needs to be done is already being done by someone somewhere, but not at scale, not across the board, and that's the bit that needs to change. And that's, again, where civil society comes in. That pressure has enabled us to get to where we are today in Glasgow, but that pressure is going to take us further as well. So it needs to be kept up. And that's what the Fair Water Footprints Declaration is all about. So we will continue to work very closely with you in the UK. We are proud to do so, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lord President. <laughs> Thank you. An, an open invitation there for, for us all to keep that pressure on is, I'm sure, it would be heeded by many in the room. Um, if I might invite Minister Tembo to join us. Um, 
she will be uh, talking very, very kindly about why the government of Malawi has chosen to sign the declaration today and what steps the government will be taking, again, to turn this, uh, this commitment into reality. So, Minister Tembo, it's with great honour that I introduce you to the stage today. I'm so happy to be here this morning uh, to have to commit the Malawi government and, oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Let me Perhaps I should take this. I would help too. <laughs> Once again, I am happy uh, to be here on behalf of the Malawi government. We have signed this declaration, the Global Declaration on Fair Water Footprints. Why have we done so? We have signed because we subscribe to the call for zero pollution. We subscribe to sustainable utilization and equitable, equitable allocation of water. We subscribe to protection of, the of, the, of nature, access to safe water and hygiene for all, and of course resilience to drought, floods, climate variability, and water conflicts. <clears throat> As a producer country, we know very well that sustainable water management is critical not only in securing jobs, protecting the environment and growing our economy, but also in positioning our economy as a competitive player on the global market. Water footprints being embedded, water that is used in the global production and consumption of food, clothes and other goods have a major influence on society's climate and water challenges. As such, we as a country that is responsible and that realizes that without water, nothing happens, we have committed to sign this declaration. We are glad that uh, private business in our country is taking responsibility and positioning yourself, itself to making sure that it joins the it joins the stewardship of water. We have examples of uh, stewardship, good stewardship of water, in a cooperative in southern of Malawi, where the tea industry is championing the good use of water. They are recycling, they are monitoring, they are making sure that the water is not being wasted, but also the water that is used within their factories does not go on to pollute the rivers within their vicinity. And therefore, as a country, we commit, as government of Malawi, we're committing that we shall be part of this movement that looks after water that will ensure that sustainable water use is there done for us but also for future future generations i therefore call upon you here present and those participating virtually to join together in the declaration of the global fair water footprints for sustainable future and the sustainable planet Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, for those very powerful words, and thank you for joining us today in what I know is a very, very busy schedule for you. I'd now like to introduce Malesi Shibaji. Uh, Malesi joins us all the way from Kenya. He is the chair of a new, and he will explain exactly what that acronym is um, as soon as he joins us on the stage. Uh, Celesi is here, uh, sorry, Malesi is here representing civil society organizations. Thank you, Malesi. 
Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, <coughs> the Africa Civil Society Network on Water and Sanitation, ANEW, um, joins the team that has signed this declaration because we look at it as a very important turn in the dual pursuit of water stewardship and climate, just, climate change justice. Today, we have jointly resolved to take transformative action for fair water footprints and which will provide durable benefits for our, for our communities, for our ecosystems, and for our economies and will further help to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, and in our case, particularly focusing on Goal 6, which seeks to ensure availability and sustainable management of access to water and sanitation for all. As civil society from Africa, I would like to reiterate why this is important to us. And this is important to us because for far too long, Africa's trade with the rest of the world has largely been driven by extraction and overexploitation of our natural resources. It has resulted in tragic condi conditions for our workers and growing inequality within our communities. And regardless of which industry it is, whether it's textiles, whether it's um, um, agriculture, floriculture, mining, our potential as a continent has continuously been eroded by irresponsible and unethical practices in the globalized supply chains. The abuse of water is top on the list, and it has exacerbated the challenges of an already water-deprived population in a continent bearing the biggest burden in the impacts of climate change. As civil society organizations, we take particular pride in seeing this formal resolution coming to pass. The declaration we sign today re-emphasizes the centrality of improved water management in the response to climate emergency in Africa, and for the first time, looks at water stewardship actions from both the climate change perspective as well as the sustainability perspective. We see this declaration as providing a new mechan uh, mechanism for accountability, which can bolster existing governance efforts globally, but particularly in Africa. And indeed, it sets the pace on the need for new incentives, the drivers and controls to curtail destructive water use, and embed more sustainable modes of water use by business and investors. As the Africa Civil Society Network and with all our constituencies, we stand tall in supporting this declaration. Civil society will play an important part in providing oversight and accountability monitoring. But we also join in this declaration so that we can ensure the voices of communities, of women, young people, and all the marginalized persons are heard and responded to. We look forward to working closely with the media to ensure a tenacious 
and informed coverage, and where appropriate, facilitating, convening, and advising as part of the partnership. As I conclude, I want to recognize and salute the impressive leadership we have seen from the government of the UK, uh, led by Lord Goldsmith, and of course the government of Malawi, um, led by the Honorable Minister, and the unique partnership that this uh, initiative provides, including the corporates, the Sustainable and Water for All Partnership, uh, water aid, and civil society overall. I call on others to join this bandwagon as we now fold back our sleeves and look forward to working hard towards putting the words that we, are, we have in this declaration into action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malesi. And we're now going to turn the floor over to our final speaker of this session, uh, Kate Gibson, who is here to represent Diageo as their director of Diageo in Society, um, but it, and is also speaking on behalf of the other businesses that have also signed this declaration today. Thank you, Kate. Over to you. Thank you very much. I hope you can uh, hear me okay. I'm delighted to be joining you virtually. Um, and uh, the, the focus on action here is, uh, is brilliant to see. Um, so as uh, what I wanted to do today is just share a little bit of a perspective from, um, from the private sector uh, as a founding signatory to the Fair Water Footprint um, Declaration. And it's great to see the momentum uh, that's already being built uh, today. Um, so Diageo is a global beverage company um, with operations around the world. So water is an absolutely essential uh, ingredient in our products and most importantly, a, a critical resources for uh, the communities where we live, work, uh, source and sell. And that's why we've been focused on uh, water stewardship since 2007. And that's in, across all of our operations uh, through our value chain, our sourcing communities, uh, and also critically joining forces with others to advocate uh, for more focus from the private sector and other actors on the water crisis. Uh, and as be has been discussed today, uh, and is you know, obviously the link between the climate crisis uh, and water stress, both of which are uh, being exacerbated and both of which uh, have a disproportionate impact on uh, on the most vulnerable in society. So um, I share the, uh, the call and the emphasis of our, of our previous speaker in terms of a focus on SDG 6 as a critical unlock uh, to deliver many of the other SDGs in this uh, decade of action through to 2030. Um, and that's why uh, as part of our 2030 uh, Society 2030 Spirit of Progress plan, which we recently launched, uh, we have ramped up focus uh, in terms of all aspects of water stewardship, um, water use efficiency, particularly in water stressed areas, uh, water replenishment, uh, focus on the provision of clean water, sanitation and hygiene, and then ramped up focus on collective action uh, in priority water basins. Um, and it's really, it, it's, it's across all those areas that the ambition of this declaration today is just so incredibly critical uh, and why we were very keen um, to, to, to come on board at this early stage. Um, we really recognize the need to collect with others to deliver uh, not only the targets we want to achieve, but the water security across uh, these water stress basins. And we're actively seeking to collaborate with governments, NGOs, civil society, and other businesses uh, in these basins to collect collectively address these water risks, support local communities uh, in adaptation to climate change, and transition to this critical water secure future that we need to see. Um, and I think what's great about uh, the action to date and the declaration today is for the first time we have governments, NGOs, civil society and other stakeholders signing up to this comprehensive declaration of intent for a water secure future and business has a critical role to play as being part of this progressive commitment. Uh, we're particularly pleased to see the leadership from the UK government uh, from Malawi and from the other governments who've also signed this declaration today. And it really is only by working together that we can achieve the progress we need at the pace we need to move at. Uh, and the global water crisis is immense, as we know, and we have to work together to address this emergency. So I would encourage uh, businesses around the world, small and large, 
to join forces and to commit to this important declaration. Thank you. So we are going to move on to our final segment now, and if I can introduce, uh, invite Paul to join me on the stage. Um, <clears throat> We have, the, our final statement, uh, segment is focused on systemic transformation, recognizing that the small, that big actions from a small number of institutions is vital, of course, but the real change is needed within some of the, the systems that fundamentally dictate our behavior if we're to deliver change at scale. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Simpson, who is the CEO of CDP, onto the stage. And um, we also are joined by Jean Boissonnet, who is the Deputy Director of Financial Stability at the Banque de France, and also the Head of the Secretariat for the NGFS, another acronym for you to get your, your heads and your names, uh, your tongues around, but that is the Network for Greening the Financial System. Financial system. Oh. We are having a, um, a, a waterside chat, uh, uh, which will form the, 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 the final segment of our day. And I'm hoping that we can go to you, Jean, first um, and have a, a conversation about uh, what the NGFS actually is, perhaps help the audience in the room understand uh, what, what it is that you do. Yes, thanks so much, Kate. And I, I, I mean, I hope you'll get me uh, OK from, from Paris where I sit. Um, so the NGFS is, um, is a network of uh, 100 members as of uh, yesterday, well, not yesterday, but the day before. We announced uh, the, uh, the um, you know, we, we welcomed the 100th member to the NGFS. So it's a platform that has been joined by central banks and supervisors who wanted to work together uh, on tackling very difficult issues um, about climate change. But the, the, the acronym Network for Greening the Financial System is actually uh, about more than just climate, and we're starting increasingly to focus on other nature-related developments. This is something we do uh, not on top of our mandate or, you know, because we care about, uh, about it uh, for the sake of it, but because we believe that within our mandate and because of our mandate, we need to look at these questions, which are, which are uh, questions that have macroeconomic and financial stability implications. So these are central banks believing and understanding that, uh, that these um, developments do have, a, do have something to, to, or do mean something uh, for their con the conduct of their mandates that, that come together, collaborate to understand exactly for all of our business lines uh, what it means to take these into account. The, the NGFS and indeed the Banque de France have been working on... Oh. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a typical, for those of us who have been Zooming for the last year and a half, I'm sure we can all appreciate the, uh, the challenge of the sounds and the feedback. Um, the NGFS and Banque de France have been working on climate change for some time now. Um, what actions have you taken and, and what has happened as a result of those actions? Yes, in, in fact, the, um, to, to, to I mean, get a picture, uh, it's, it's perhaps interesting to understand that what we do is, uh, I mean, the reports we publish is only the, uh, the top of the iceberg that you can, that you can see. Uh, so basically, uh, after having understood exactly uh, what it means to um, take into account, or that we need to take into account climate change and other um, nature-related risks into, our, into, into the work, uh, our work, uh, monitoring financial stability, uh, supervising banks, um, implementing monetary policy and, and so on and so forth. Uh, for each of these business lines, basically, we have sat down and try to try to you know synthesize the best practices or build the practical tools we need as a as a, a network uh, to be able to take these into uh, into account. Uh, so very concretely, and because we supervise all of the global systemically important uh, bank, for example, two thirds of the. Uh, of the uh, globally systemic uh, insurance companies, uh, and we collectively, you know, operate in jurisdictions that represent almost, or, well, actually more now than 85% of, of global GDP. What it means is that now all the members have the practical tools to turn that into uh, actual action. So, uh, for example, turning turning these reports into uh, supervisory expectations. Uh, and, and, and getting beyond supervisory expectations by being very practical in what we expect and in telling firms, the firms we supervise, about what we expect to, to see um, in, you know, in their uh, risk management practices, for example. It, it's also um, 
well, almost 30 institutions that are currently running stress tests on, on climate-related risks, uh, either top-down or bottom-up. And this is something we, we so what we do basically is then translated by the members uh, very quickly, turned into action very quickly by the, by the members. And one prime example of that is that uh, on, on Wednesday morning, the chair of the NGFS, Frank Elderson, has taken the floor uh, at, uh, here in, in Glasgow uh, to present the, the NGFS Glasgow Declaration, which was uh, our statement, our commitment to keep on doing the work we are doing. So, for example, we are building scenarios that people can use to, uh, to assess their risks, and, and we will be uh, continuing to improve, to upgrade, and to update uh, these scenarios. And along this declaration, uh, we had almost two-thirds of the network members um, saying very concretely, these are the things uh, we will be doing in the coming years, um, you know, uh, improving and strengthening the, the supervision of this risk, uh, going for uh, stress testing, uh, changing the way we manage our non-monetary portfolio, taking this risk into all this development into account, into, uh, into the conduct of monetary policy and, and so on and so forth. So basically we learn, we build collectively uh, the tools we need to operate and then each and every one member of the network is, is implementing that uh, in his own jurisdiction. And so what does that mean for, for water? Indeed, I mean, we, we started, uh, when, we, when we look at climate change, uh, basically we have this uh, very usual uh, way of, um, you know, looking at uh, transition risk on one side, physical risk on, on the other. Uh, and when we look at physical risk, uh, water is coming very, very high on the on the on the list. But as as you mentioned, I mean, there are uh, climate change related developments with regard to water, but water goes beyond climate change, uh, and and it's also something we are starting to to look at. We are in we are currently investigating uh, um, nature related risk. Uh, i.e. or, for example, uh, you know, the risk associated with uh, biodiversity losses and, and so on. And we are trying to understand where we have collective blind spots. And once we have identified this, this blind spot, we are trying to very much um, uh, understand this and, and start to, be, start to operational, operationalize the way we look at, uh, at, this, uh, at this blind spot. And we basically cast some light on this blind spot to make sure that we are not doing uh, things that are, you know, detrimental to uh, to nature uh, unwillingly, um, because we are very conscious that nature-blind financial flows are damaging the, uh, the the nature. We're going to move to Paul now, um, and it's on that front, uh, that, that point of, of nature-blind financial flows that I think we'll we'll discuss. Um, more deeply. Um, we know that, say, the Banque de France um, have been implementing climate-related financial disclosure requirements for some time, and indeed last year found that those organizations that are subject to climate-related disclosure rules are more likely to stop funding uh, fossil fuel companies um, compared to those companies that are not subject to disclosure. Now, at CDP, this is one of the, the, the core instruments that you use to drive change. So can you share with the audience today, Paul, your experience of climate-related financial disclosure and the, the impact that you think that's had over the last 20 years of running the organization? Yeah, thank, thank you, Kay, and um, great pleasure to be here. And I'll, I'll just start by saying I think how important it is to be having a, a dialogue on water security at a COP. Obviously, the focus of COP is climate, but climate and water are completely interrelated, as we've been hearing you know, uh, from, from many people. Um, you know, often you could say, really, carbon emissions are actually a waste product of human activity and we need to eliminate that waste product to zero. Uh, that's what COP's about, let's get to net zero, secure 1.5. Um, but water, you know, is the lifeblood of human society and economy, you know, we, we're completely reliant on it in, in everything we do. So the net zero transition is going to require us to also ensure we have adequate, secure water supplies. And, you know, I've learned a lot from you about this over the years, Kate. So, you know, at CDP we created um, a disclosure mechanism in the year 2000, initially focused on climate change to transform capital markets and put climate risk and opportunity at the heart of decisions. And to do that, investors were telling us, you know, this is a long while ago, 20 years ago, what we need to do that is data and information. As investors, you know, we can't act, and nor can companies and cities and governments, without good data. So we created a, a global climate and now environmental disclosure mechanism 
uh, you know, initially it was really hard. People said, is climate change real? Why should we measure? Why should we disclose? Oh, it's this thing in the future. We'll kind of worry about it in 20 years' time. Well, we're here now, 20 years' time, and we know we should have worried about it a lot more 20 years ago. So let's learn from that on climate. Because on, on water, all the statistics say we already have, you know, 3 billion people in water-scarce environments. That is increasing. World Resources Institute say that by uh, 2030, water scarcity is going to in increase by more than 50%. So through the disclosure platform of CDP, today, some 13,000 companies disclose on climate change. That's up 37% last year. So this is really becoming a norm in society and capital markets, uh, representing 64% of global market capitalization. So it, this is a norm, climate disclosure. And we're now seeing governments regulate climate disclosure, the UK, the EU, uh, and other places around the world. We saw the launch of the International Sustainability Standards Boards on Wednesday that we've been helping to inform and support. So, but we can't just do this on climate. We have to do it on water. Uh, and at CDP, we, you know, it was really the companies we were working with and a small group of investors who said, look, you're asking about climate risk and opportunity, but water is often where this is really going to bite. In some regions, some locations, climate is increasing water scarcity and our economy and the transition to net zero is equally reliant. So more than 3,000 companies now disclose on water. We learn a lot through the disclosure process. You know, what is happening, where the risks are, what is leading practice that everybody needs to move toward, and what are the barriers where some innovation or some collaboration of public-private partnership or investment that will be required to, to get over those barriers. So I think, you know, we're here at COP, we're late, you know, let's be honest, um, acting on climate, and now we have to go very, very fast. But let's not put water to the side. Let's understand that climate, water, forest, nature, you know, CP also does disclosure on forest and deforestation. They're all interrelated, and we have to tackle them together to solve the climate and ecological emergency. Thanks, Paul. I couldn't agree more. Now, um, w the work that we, you've been doing for, 20, to, for 10 years on water has been focused on the companies themselves, those direct, large, multinational institutions that are consuming an awful lot of water and, and, and ultimately also polluting it. Um, <clears throat> there is still no global requirements for financial institutions, however, those banks that are fueling these, these companies to grow in certain ways um, to ultimately assess water-related risks nor provide information to the market about how they're managing this. And I believe CDP is about to launch a program to solve that problem. Yes, we are. Well, you know, in 1997, the IPCC described inve institutional investors uh, that Jean is kind of uh, you know, working with and responsible for to some extent as aggregators of risk from climate change, um, but also aggregators of risk from water. So at CDP, we're really excited. We're going to launch the first ever water-related reporting framework for financial institutions. It's natural that financial institutions start by needing data from companies, but they can then assess their own risk as these aggregators of, of risk. And this is very much what the NGFS is looking at, systemic risk. You know, so where investors owning a slice of the world's economy are, are aggregating that risk. So the new framework will enable investors to, to both measure and disclose their own risks from water. Um, we know that that will be a learning process. You know, how will they start? What are the risks? What are the impacts? Um, I think the NGFS can play a key role in sharing and facilitating that learning process. Um, we're not doing this under, as a, just the CDP, we're doing it with some partners, the Dutch Valuing Water Initiative, the Water Footprint Network and, and Mercer. And this development, like, like many developments we see here now, is market-led. It, it comes from investors with support from, from NGOs and others. And I think it will give us critical data about the systemic risk from water to financial institutions and to, you know, more broadly to financial markets, capital markets. Thank you, Paul. I'm afraid we're at time, so I'm going to call our, our conversation to a close now, but I think it's worth reflecting for the audience that with over $100 trillion worth of assets under management and um, 100, over $100 trillion, uh, in loans being issued every year to companies that dictate how those companies grow and where they grow, changing the way in which that finance flows and provides the incentive for companies in particular to behave differently and to begin valuing water in a way in which they are currently not. And that is why I am particularly excited about this work and very pleased to be able to share it with you today. So please join me in thanking our panel today. And thank you, Paul. Please uh, make your way up the stage. And thank you, John.
So we have one final video, if you'd like to, to leave. Thank you, Paul. We have one final video for you, uh, which I think we have time to play or not, James. What do you say? Yes, we have got Penelope Cruz lined up for you. Uh, a little bit of magic for the end of our session before I hand over to, to Henk Ovink, who will provide us with our closing statement. So please watch the screens. I am water. To humans, I am simply just there. I'm something they just take for granted. But there is only so much of me, and more and more of them every single day. I start as rain in the mountains, flow to the rivers and streams, and end up in the ocean. Then the cycle begins again. And it will take me 10,000 years to get back to the state I'm in now. But to humans, I'm just water, just there. Where will humans find me when there are billions more of them around? Where will they find themselves? Will they wage wars over me, like they do over everything else? That's always an option. But it's not the only option. Thank you, Penelope Cruz. Uh, thank you all. First of all, thank you, Kate and Jennifer, for doing this full day. I think they deserve, a, with their partners, a massive applause. I exactly have um, one minute to close this off. I'm Henk Oving, Special Envoy for International Water Affairs, and Kate asked me to wrap this up. Uh, and I can't because everything was discussed with everybody, and I think that was critical important. We brought water to the climate conversation at the COP, central today, but also the first water pavilion we have. Water is critical for the 1.5. Without water, no 1.5, but also critical for adaptation, and it is critical for everyone in society. You've been hearing from NGOs, individuals, companies, investors, governments, and across how important water is. The power of water, that is what you heard. And that is also what I want you to remember. Investing in water trickles down across everything in society, across SDGs, across climate action. Eh? And for today, we go to Egypt next year, and then we go to 2023, the UN Water Conference, eh? the second one in the history of the UN, the first one since 1977. But then what? It is about action, and that is what you heard. So that power of water, that can devastate societies, biodiversity, mankind, people that are most marginalized across the world, that power brings us together. And I want you to remember that power of water tomorrow when you wake up, when there is not a water action zone day, when you are discussing something else in the climate environment, that water is actually core and central to everything in life, and that is actually capacitating everyone and everything. So. Please remember that power of water, drink it, embrace it, embrace each other, work together and help us lead to this more water secure world for everyone because we need it, we deserve it and it can only work if we come together, work together across all scales, in all regions, in all environments, at all times. Thank you.